want to start by more formally introducing our uh, guests uh, on this discussion on the politics of crime, starting with Martin Bakula. He has been Victoria's Attorney General since December 2014. He's been in the Victorian Parliament since 2006, first in the Upper House before shifting to the Legislative Assembly, where he currently holds the seat of Keysborough. Uh, Martin also served as a minister in the Brumby government. And if uh, state politics wasn't a bruising enough character-forming experience, he is also a long-time member of the Carlton Football Club. Please make him welcome. Thank you, Michael. John Pizzuto entered the Victorian Parliament at the 2014 election, winning Ted Bailey's former seat of Hawthorne. John immediately took on the role of the Shadow Attorney General. Pretty obvious choice, as John has spent most of his professional life in the law and also served as legal counsel to former Premier Dennis Napthine. Uh, he is hoping to, to go one better in November at the next election by taking Martin Pakula's job. Please make John Pizzuto very welcome. They're all very nice. Belinda Wilson is the president of the Law Institute of Victoria, the peak body for the state's legal profession. She took up the position at the start of last year after serving as president of the Gippsland Law Association, representing an area of the state, a beautiful area of the state, where Belinda has spent most of her time as a working lawyer. Belinda has another passion. It is the seafood industry. She's currently a director of the peak body seafood industry Australia, and I'll resist the obvious parallels between lawyers and sharks. Other people might want to make that. Please make Belinda very welcome. And last but not least, the Honourable Justice Lex Lasry served on the Supreme Court bench from 2007 until June this year, although he's just about to return as a reserve judge. What's that line from The Godfather? Just when I thought I'd got out, they dragged me back in. I had a good move too. <laughs> uh, before becoming a judge, uh, Lex Lazary was a senior defence counsel in a number of high-profile cases. He represented convicted Australian drug smuggler Van Nguyen, of course, in Singapore unsuccessfully. Uh, he was executed in 2005. Uh, he was the law counsel's observer at Guantanamo Bay, which is where Lex and I first met at the trial of David Hicks. I was there as the ABC correspondent. Lex was there as the observer. Uh, for the Law Council, and we were both marvelling at that un unique form of justice known as the US Military Commissions. It was a sight to behold, I can assure you. Uh, Lex, in his uh, downtime, also plays in his band called the Lex Pistols. Apparently, he's a very good drummer. He gives Charlie Watts a run for his money. So uh, he's uh, uh, looking forward to his uh, perspective on all matters legal today. So please make Justice Lex Lazary very welcome as well. Now, I want to keep this uh, fairly free-flowing as possible. I'll, I'll start with a conversation with all of our four guests here. We'll have a bit of back and forth, and uh, I'd also like to get questions from you on the floor as well, starting with some working journalists, then uh, anybody who'd like to ask a question, any particular concern regarding law and order, you're more than welcome. But I want to start with our politicians first, and I'll ask the same question to both of you, starting with you, Martin Bakula. What do you see as the... Uh, area of concern in the law and order area of most concern to Victorian voters and how is your party dealing with it? Well, thank you, Michael, and um, it's lovely to be here with uh, colleagues and friends and, and I include John amongst that. Um, look, I think there are a range of issues. The government has been uh, very clear for the last four years and going back um, into our time in opposition that we've seen family violence as a substantial and compelling law and order issue uh, and it's why we uh, implemented the Royal Commission into Family Violence and followed that up uh, with uh, our acceptance of all 227 recommendations and $2 billion worth of funding uh, to support family violence related initiatives. Uh, but I recognise that there are a range of other um, significant concerns uh, in the community, whether it be about the crime rate more generally, and it's why the government has invested so heavily in uh, new police, and it's why we've changed uh, a number of laws, whether they be about bail, community corrections orders, parole uh, and sentencing. Um, uh, you know, I've spent quite a lot of my time uh, as uh, Attorney General dealing with various parts of the uh, legislative book in regards to child sexual assault, both historic uh, and current, uh, whether it's been about joining the redress scheme, um, removing the Ellis defence, uh, taking out the statute of limitations, 
Uh, and um, there's no question at all that there's been uh, community concern about street violence and the government, uh, you know, qu quite um, separate to uh, some of the assertions about uh, not being prepared to recognise that. In fact, I think the government has named that and recognised it, uh, and we've dealt with that via both uh, resource allocation uh, and by changes to the law, whether it's been about laws regarding home invasion or carjacking, uh, uh, you know, and, and many others. Uh, and, and obviously there's been a suite of counter-terrorism reforms as well, which has been about uh, ensuring that we give Victoria Police all of the tools that they need to keep the community safe. So there's no single um, answer, Michael, there's no single issue, uh, but, you know, I've, you know, as Attorney General I've been uh, intimately involved in all of those issues, whether it's been family violence, child sexual assault, um, street crime, uh, or, or indeed um, the other ones that I've mentioned. And, uh, you know, I think all of those will play a role and be factors in the, uh, in the election that begins in 12 days and concludes in 24. John Pizzuto. Thank you, Michael. Can I say <clears throat> to you and the Press Club, to the Law Institute, the Honourable Martin Pakula, uh, Your Honour and Belinda, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming along and hearing us out. Look, I'd, I'd identify four general areas. There are many, but I'd identify four. My principal concern at the broadest level is that you can't have a justice system, in my view, that increasingly talks to itself. And I have spent the last four years with my colleagues travelling around the state. And yes, we have a fundamentally sound system with long-standing institutions, with important traditions and doctrines around those institutions. But for me, as potentially an Attorney General, I'm concerned about that disconnect. Now, for many of us, we may live in areas, as do I, that are relatively safe. But when you go out to other parts of, say, outer suburban Melbourne, regional Victoria, the story ain't nearly the same. So that informs a lot of my thinking around this. I want a justice system that connects with and is seen to connect with the people it is there to serve. Sentencing has been a highly contested area of policy and it will continue to be so over the coming weeks, perhaps well into the future. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But I do think, not for all sentencing, but for sentencing in relation to serious and violent crime, I don't think that sentencing has reflected community expectations as well as it could. And I would say something similar about bail. It doesn't mean that every bail decision, every sentencing decision is a problem. At the lower level of offending, I don't think we've got a problem in Victoria in these areas. But I do think at the serious end, when I talk to communities, when I talk to practitioners, when I talk to some judges and magistrates confidentially, I hear a very similar chorus. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Something you're never going to read about, but which I think is perhaps one of the greatest things we need to do in justice, is to deal with the level of reoffending. And I'm not just talking about reoffending for people who serve time in prison. I'm talking also, and perhaps more troublingly, about reoffending for people who don't go to prison. As we know, most people who are found guilty of an offence serve their sentence out in the community. That's not a bad thing. In fact, that makes one of, uh, one of the reasons why our justice system is a good system. But we have seen massive increases in the level of reoffending by people on those orders. And what that tells us is that something's going wrong, not just across prison programs, but across programs across the whole range of areas, from rehabilitation, diversion, education, training, that need to be reformed. And if I can summarise it thus, what I want to do, if I get the chance to work with all of you and other stakeholders and my colleagues, is to look at shifting our focus away from outputs more to outcomes. That's a very simple way of describing a very complex problem. But we want to have a look at those programs to see how can we help them be more effective. Because if we've got a 60% increase, according to the budget papers, in the level of reoffending for people who aren't going to prison, that tells us we've got a problem, we have to deal with it. Uh, Victims, the role of victims in the justice system. You may have seen we made an announcement last year. There's a whole lot of work that I think needs to be done. And I think that will have a salutary effect on so many other aspects of our justice system. Improving and enhancing the role and voice of victims, say, in criminal trials, I think not only enhances public confidence in the criminal trial system and our justice system overall, but it will also 
I think, have a normative effect on many offenders. And maybe our system, in part, is failing in that area because offenders don't see as well as they might the impact of their actions on victims. We want to give victims more of a say, guarantee rights to be genuinely consulted over important decisions. We want to give them more of a say on victim impact statements. There's got to be more we can do to let victims ventilate that deep anguish and grief. And I know I've spoken to many of you about that. I think that is a very high priority in the system. Access to compensation, I think, is something we very much need to do to improve that. The other thing I'll just finish on very quickly, Michael, I know we're running out of time, but we'll talk about in a moment is court delays, and that's a, that's a huge area. I want to talk about court delays, certainly, uh, but uh, going back to your argument of sentencing not meeting community expectations, uh, visibly saw Justice Lazary chomping at the bit there, and I want to bring in, turn the conversation to mandatory sentencing, the Coalition promising mandatory sentencing for a range of offences, Labor 2, for some offences including attacks on emergency workers. Justice Lex Lazary, mandatory sentencing, does it work, does it work, if not, why not? Um, well, we, in a sense, I suppose we don't know. My opinion is that it won't. We have some sentencing in Victoria that is directive, though not actually mandatory. Um, but in the end, if it comes down to a regime where a sentence for a particular violent offence is a minimum of, say, 25 years for murder, with no exceptions, then I think the system will create a large number of problems. Uh, because sentencing's always meant to be individualised. Sentencing's always about the particular case. It's always about the moral culpability of what the offender did. It's also about matters of remorse, matters of rehabilitation, and a sentence is tailored to deal with a particular case. Uh, a one-size-fits-all program simply doesn't fit with that process of sentencing, which primarily is a fair uh, system. Um, plus, there are other issues about mandatory sentencing in particular, including taking away from people um, the incentive to plead guilty. Uh, people will wonder, why should I plead guilty? Why should I negotiate in relation to the facts that are put before the court? Why should I offer any sort of plea if the best I can do is 25 years or whatever the mandatory sentence is? Um, so, th and I think there's plenty of writing around the world to indicate, both in the United States and here, that whether or not mandatory sentencing has any effect on making the community safer is perhaps, if I can put it neutrally, very much contested. I don't think it will um, because it assumes a rational choice made before an offence is committed by the offender and of course in a large number of violent offences there's no rational choice being made. It's a choice which is the product either of drugs or alcohol or some combination of both or some mental state. Um, so there's a lot to talk about but having said that of course if Whoever the government is after the election, if they um, introduce a regime of strict mandatory sentencing, well, the courts will simply have to deal with it. Belinda Wilson, I know the Institute has strong views on that. I want to hear that, then I'll toss that back to the police. Mm. Thank you, and it's a delight to be here today. Look, I think from, from our research, um, studies have showed that mandatory sentencing is not a deterrent. Um, the whole approach on tough on crime is also not a deterrent. Let's just, if we're in an alternate world, and if that was the case, we would not have our prisons bursting at the seams. We're about to reach 8,000 in prisons at the moment. We would not have our taxpayer-funded dollars of $2.3 million a day being spent on our prison system to house almost 8,000. And we would not see uh, sorry, 43.6% of prisoners returning to prison within two years of being released. So the Law Institute and our profession are really advocating for a change in this debate. It's not who can be toughest on crime. It is about how can we look at crime holistically. Let's look at the root causes of crime. Let's look at solutions. And for us, that includes looking at health and wellbeing. It's looking at investing in education, prevention, the parole system, rehabilitation. It's been found, um, and Lex alluded to it just before, um, Texas, um, a number of years ago, as has um, New Zealand, implemented investment or reinvestment into the justice system. And what that has actually found is that changes 
the numbers, it dr drastically reduces the prison population. It makes the community safer. It has financial impact because that money can actually be reinvested into growing communities. So that's where we'd really like to see that, that debate shift. Okay, to. fairly strong pushback there from the legal profession. I want to get both Polly's views on that, but starting with you, John Pizzuto, if you're elected as Attorney General, these are the people you have to work with, people with very strong concerns about minimum sentences, mandatory sentences. Does that give you any pause for thought? I would, I would of course, work with all stakeholders, but let me, let me put a few things on the table about our mandatory sentencing proposals. I've outlined already that general disconnect. Uh, the mandatory sentencing proposals that uh, we have released work as follows. They apply only to the most serious violence offences, 11 on them for the current, current discussion we're having, 11 of the most serious violence offences. It doesn't apply to you on a first offence. It applies to you on a second offence. It only applies to an adult. And even if you pass through those thresholds, we still will allow for exceptional circumstances. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is that the argument about mandatory sentencing not being a deterrent is, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, I respect all, all panellists, but it's actually not an argument against mandatory sentencing, it's actually an argument against custodial sentencing as a deterrent, full stop. The mandatory sentencing proposals that we put in place are designed to reflect a penalty that really does give vent to the community's concern about those most serious offences for a repeat offender. Martin Pakula, the uh, Andrews government, has walked down this path as well in terms of tightening bail conditions, mandatory sentencing promised for some uh, offences. Uh, where, where do you stand? Well, let, let me deal with those two things uh, and then come back to something John said. Um, we have absolutely tightened bail conditions uh, and we took what I think is the very best of advice from uh, Justice Coghlan in doing so. We've implemented faithfully many of the recommendations that he provided to government uh, and those bail changes, wh whether people think that they are um, desirable or not, uh, there's no doubt that they are having an effect. I had a, a police officer stop me in uh, Seymour the other day and just said, thanks for the bail changes, it's made our life much, much easier. In regards to uh, sentencing, uh, what the government's actually done, you've never actually, I, I defy anyone to say they've heard me refer to our regime as mandatory sentencing. And I've had this conversation with Belinda. Um, we've brought in a standard sentencing scheme for a dozen offences which replaces uh, the baseline sentencing scheme. Uh, and I think that's having its first tests before the court kind of as we speak, uh, but that's not about providing strict mandatory sentencing. Uh, the judges have uh, no option but to follow it. It, it allows them uh, some, some leeway, which we think is appropriate. We have uh, indeed followed on in regards to statutory minimum sentences. They were first introduced by my predecessor, uh, Robert Clark, in regards to intentionally causing serious injury in circumstances of gross violence. Uh, but they are statutory minimum sentences where the special reasons clause is maintained, although in the most recent set of changes we have tightened the special reasons clause. I, I suppose the issue I take, uh, I take with what uh, John has said is twofold. Um, he talks about only 11 serious violence offences. As I recall only a week or two ago, the Leader of the Opposition was making an announcement about mandatory sentencing for breaches of intervention orders. Um, so that's you know, that's not what, I don't think anyone would describe that as one of the 11 serious violence offences. Secondly, I accept what John says about um, his proposal maintaining um, a special reasons or an exceptional circumstances exemption. My response to that would be to say, that's good, I don't know why you keep calling it mandatory sentencing. Um, because, uh, you know, perhaps they've got some ideas about changing the special reasons exemption further than those that we've already made, um, but I would not describe that as mandatory sentencing. I describe as mandatory sentencing the US-style system where there is no exception whatsoever uh, and there are, you know, as I think many of us know, in those circumstances, some grossly disproportionate outcomes. Ari Freiberg, who was the chair of the Sentencing Advisory Council, has looked both policies, a uh, very highly respected figure in the legal community, and uh, she says, Victoria used to be a less severe jurisdiction than others, but that has now been firmly upended. Focus on rehabilitation lost in the scramble to be seen to be the toughest. And Lex Lazary, I want to go with you. You picked up a bit on the, the, the causes of crime. And uh, is rehabilitation uh, being lost in this 
as some lawyers would argue, race to the political bottom? Um, I think there's a risk of that, Michael, because I mean, there's a discussion about the courts being out of touch with the community's expectations. And uh, one of the things that we perhaps need to think about is what does that mean? How do we, how do we understand what the community's expectations are? No one in the community understands the detail in a particular sentencing exercise. That's why judges are there to do it. <clears throat> um, <coughs> and perhaps, in a sense, it's better if we are more active in letting the, uh, in letting the community know how the process works. Um, but the Sentencing Act itself specifies a number of things that a judge must take into account. Now, any judge imposing a sentence is imposing the sentence in the hope that the sentence overall will prevent the offender from reoffending. That might be because that offender is specifically deterred from reoffending. It may be simply the, the prospect of jail is enough to make that person change their life and to change their instincts. But two things that happen, which are very important to judges imposing sentences, are genuine rehabilitation that's either underway and uh, incomplete at the time of sentence, and also remorse. Some offenders are incredibly remorseful for what they've done. Some other offenders who've had the opportunity because they've been on bail leading up to the sentence have undergone a series of steps to rehabilitate themselves and pledge that to continue. There are all sorts of things that a court can do to make sure that does happen. Those are processes that really are very effective in preventing crime. It doesn't always work. Of course it doesn't always work and sometimes people will re-offend. But my concern about the tough on sentencing process is that um, rehabilitation, remorse and the personal characteristics of the offender become diminished. And my other concern generally about the concept of mandatory sentencing is that in a sense it's the, it's the government, whichever government is saying it, saying to judges, we don't trust you. And I think that in a sense, in a sense is a bit unfair, bearing in mind that um, the rate of appeal in relation to sentencing in Victoria is about 3%, half or less of which are applications to increase the sentence. Um, I, I think there are some real concerns about this debate. I think there are some real concerns about the way the courts are treated in this debate by all sides. I'm not being specific about anybody. Um, and I also think it would be important for the community to have more information to be better informed about the way the process works. I want you to pick up on that, Belinda, as well. I also want to pivot to what John Pizzuto raised earlier, and I want to flesh it out with both he and Martin as well. Court resources. Uh, preparing for this lunch, I've spoken to a lot of lawyers and people in the court system who say uh, they are all straining at the bit because more police is great, but it results in more offenders going through courts. Uh, already having limited budgets, and that's before we get to the bursting jails, which is another point of conversation. So w where do you stand on the lack of rehabilitation and what are your members telling you about how courts are coping, or in this case, not coping? Yeah, well, to answer that, I think the, the first thing to do is go back to the, the bail issue that was raised by Martin. And I can say, when Martin was saying the police are thanking him, the look of horror on some very senior practitioners in this room, um, members of our profession that care, that go over and beyond what is their requirement, um, were horrified. And the, the bail system, um, that is a classic example of a disconnect between um, new laws and actually implication and resourcing. So the, the bail laws, what we are seeing is there has not been significant funding coming through for the proper oper operation. Um, we are now seeing our magistrate's court effectively turned into a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation. How is that good for our magistrates and how is that good for our practitioners? It can't be good. Um, Victoria Legal Aid does not have significant funding to be able to assist um, those that have to appear. And we are now seeing a system where you, the presumption of um, going to prison um, as opposed to getting bail. Our practitioners are dealing with some very low level um, offences and their clients are held in remand for excessive periods. And this is only causing delays to our court system that's already at breaking point. So we, of course, 
do need a lot of investment in our court systems. We need more magistrates. We need better infrastructure. We need IT systems that bring us up to modern day society. We still have a court system. If you go to the magistrate's court, everything is listed at 10 o'clock or 2 p.m. How does that work in today's society? Where does technology play? Um, well, it doesn't play an important part at the moment. Um, we have our courts at breaking point and we need to do something about it. We, we need to invest. And we do know uh, the serious mental health impacts this is having. Uh, we've seen it tragically with a couple of magistrates in recent times and also on other people working in the system. So the question to both you, Martin Bakula, starting with you, then John Pizzuto, what are you both going to do to improve court resources? Well, thanks, um, Michael. I, look, I, I want to take up a couple of the things that Belinda said. I don't doubt for a moment that she faithfully reflects the views of many of her members. I think it's easy, it, and you know, there, there are matters that are currently um, on foot, so I won't talk in detail about them, but it's easy to forget uh, how um, visceral the community reaction has been over certain issues in regards uh, to bail. And one thing that's, you know, that I've heard clearly, and I'm sure John has as well from the people that correspond with him, was that the community had certain expectations about the bail system which, you know, I, I believe weren't being realised. One is about uh, people who continue to offend whilst on bail uh, and continue to receive bail nevertheless. Uh, it was something that was of uh, enormous concern to the community. Uh, and the other was people who've been charged with serious violent offences uh, being bailed and in some circumstances reoffending whilst they were on bail. And that was why we asked Justice Coghlan to provide us with a suite of recommendations which, as I've said, we've implemented and I understand that they are not popular amongst many segments of the legal community and that they have caused issues for practitioners. I accept all of that but governments have a responsibility uh, to protect the community and to the extent that we can to reflect community expectations. In regards to resourcing, um, I, I'd say this. Uh, one of the things that um, you learn as Attorney General is that, um, you know, like, like in all walks of, of government life, for relatively scarce resources, you are in competition with the Minister for Health and the Minister for Public Transport and the Minister for Police uh, and all of the other um, ministers across uh, diverse portfolios in government for scarce resources. And I don't underplay the fact that it is difficult on occasion uh, to obtain those resources for our portfolio. Um, but in the last budget, um, in the last couple of budgets, let me just you know, step through some of the things that we have achieved. Uh, we've had um, over $14 million for new audiovisual equipment uh, within the magistrate's court. Uh, and there are now thousands of matters that are dealt with via audiovisual link. In the last budget, we funded 18 additional magistrates, three for the Bail and Remand Court, and we've also, for the Bail and Remand Court, which does sit late, I accept that, but we've provided additional funding for police prosecutors and for legal aid. Uh, we've provided additional funding for the Office of Public Prosecutions. We provided two additional criminal county court judges and an additional criminal Supreme Court judge. And I have no doubt that if I spoke to the heads of all of those jurisdictions, they would say, thank you, attorney, but we need more. I accept that. Um, but as I say, um, you know, you can't always get all of the resources in any individual budget cycle. Uh, I think Legal Aid's budget is about $50 million higher now than it was when we came to office. I think community legal centres have received about $34 million more than they had when we came to office. Uh, and as I say, we funded uh, AV, uh, the OPP, VLA, police prosecutors, and I accept that when you put on thousands of extra police, uh, you do need to fund the rest of the system. Uh, we have done that. Uh, now, whether or not the profession considers that to be currently adequate, uh, you know, I, I accept there's still a conversation to be had. Over to you, John Pazuta. Uh, thanks, Michael. Look, can I just make a general point uh, before I go to delays and resources? My approach is to be totally disinterested in whether you want to be tough or soft. I don't care about those labels at all. Because for me, what the tenor of reform must involve is restoring the system's credibility and authority. Now, I spoke before about sentencing. 
There's a problem underneath that around compliance with orders and breaches of things like bail, community corrections orders. And so we have to tighten all of that up because if we don't, the prospects of achieving as much as we can out of rehabilitation, diversion, education, all of those things we all know beyond all measure of doubt that are vital to reforming behaviour and personal redemption, they will not work unless you restore that credibility and authority. That's the first thing I'd say. On court resources, like Martin, I would always, if I were the Attorney General, look at advocating for as much by way of resources. But what I would say is that Victoria has for some time, compared with other jurisdictions around the country, had, if not the highest, the second highest number of judges and magistrates. Yet our cases are costing more and taking longer. So of course I would go in to advocate for more resources, but I do want the answers to some questions about why that is the case. On delays, there's a lot we can do on delays. I think we do need to crack down on adjournments. Obviously we can't abolish people's rights to seek an adjournment when it is in the interest of justice and would not compromise fairness. And equity. But there's got to be more we can do on, it, on adjournments. I'm convinced of that. I am convinced that we can do a lot more on committals to take some of them out of the system where it's not really necessary for a committal to take place. That will free up capacity. And there's also the possibility of looking at locating some administrative type hearings for prisoner related matters closer to correctional facilities. I wouldn't advocate magistrates having to sit in a correctional facility, but perhaps finding something which can reduce the number of prisoner movements would free up enormous capacity. What I would say, Belinda, in response to the issue about <coughs> bail and remand is that if we address the delay issues, that's the key to addressing that problem. I don't accept as a solution that we should have softer bail laws where it is justified to have a tougher approach only because it's a resourcing issue. We'll deal with the resources if we have to, but, but there are things we can do on delays. Uh, Belinda Wilson, you want to buy in very briefly, then I'll toss it out to the floor. Definitely. I've got an answer on the delay. Um, yes, we have a great number of judges and magistrates we could do, deal with even more. Um, but self-represented litigants, that is what is delaying our court system. We need additional Victoria Legal Aid funding. Australia-wide, we need at least $390 million more funding so that those people can actually be re uh, represented in court to assist with the court process and to streamline the court process, not clogging up our courts. Yeah, Martin. I think, I think one, uh, one area where John and I will probably be in bipartisan agreement is I think both of us would say the Commonwealth needs to pull its weight in regards to legal aid far more than it does. It used to be that Commonwealth and state legal aid funding was roughly shared 50-50. Uh, I would say it's now two to one uh, where the state funds legal aid uh, and the Commonwealth have frankly dropped the ball. And Lex Lazary? Yes, I thought I'd chime in about something else and stick up for the courts. Um, <laughs> Uh, because I, it's in, I, I can't speak for the Magistrates' Court because I just don't know enough about how that court works except that they are obviously an extremely burdened court with workload. But I can tell you from experience because until of June of this year I was part of it and also I know my counterparts in the County Court. Both the Supreme Court and the County Court have spent a lot of time and energy engaging in as much case management as is possible. Now the point is made about adjournments and of course adjournments are frustrating. It's very hard to generalise about adjournments but in the old days a person was charged with murder, they'd be presented to the Supreme Court of Victoria and sometime in the future the trial would come on. We now have a system where the court as soon as it can grabs the case, the particular case, takes charge of it, demands to know what the issues are, exhorts the practitioners to get ready, to prepare, to prepare submissions and bring the case on on the earliest date because we understand that part of the problem, I agree with, with this aspect of the discussion, part of the problem is delay. I mean one of the great problems in, with bail over the years has been that delays have meant that people have had to spend years in custody at a time when they're entitled to the benefit of the presumption of innocence. Now obviously the time between charge and trial needs to be continually reduced and the courts, you may not know, you may not even be interested, but I can tell you the courts are doing everything they can to try to reduce that time and to create new measures that will have that effect. 
I'll toss it out to the floor now. I'll start with uh, some working journalists first, then I'll spread it out to others. Uh, two things, as if you say your name and organisation when you ask the question, and to our panellists, if we can try to keep the answers as brief as possible to ensure as we get as many questions as we can. Who's our first taker? O over here, yes. There's a microphone heading your way. Oh, hi, Adam Carey from The Age here. So there are just about 8,000 people in Victorian jails at the moment, 3,000 of whom are on remand, unsentenced prisoners. We're spending in the order of $800 million a year on our prison system. All of those numbers have gone up hugely in the past decade. Is that a sign of a justice system that is failing or that is succeeding? Who wants to go first? Well, I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a go at it. Um, it's a sign of a justice system that's burdened with a great deal of work. Uh, and it's, it's obviously a sign of a justice system um, that, as far as the courts are concerned, are required to implement the laws that are passed by the parliament. And if, if that can be attributed to um, increasingly tougher rules, laws, sentences, um, then that's one explanation. What concerns me um, and I suspect it, it concerns most politicians, is that the answer to this, at least in part, is understanding the social issues that are behind the commission of crime. And until we spend perhaps more time, perhaps more resources on understanding why people do the things that put them in prison, then the numbers will continue to increase. Look, um, thanks, Adam. For me, the overarching approach must lead ultimately to lowering rates of crime. So when I talk to you about not being interested in hard or soft, but looking at how do we give the system its credibility and authority back so that we can reduce the level of breaching, which often escalates. We know that. Uh, whether it's bail, whether it's community corrections order, whether it's parole. I'm a big fan of swift and certain justice for those breaches to rein in that kind of wrongdoing. Uh, all of the things I've spoken about are deliberate and intended to constitute, if you like, a comprehensive strategy to deal with all of these problems. Why and to what end? It's to reduce the rate of crime. And the things I'm saying are more secular in nature. They haven't occurred, although you know, some of them have in the last few years, it does also manifest, I think, a drift of the system away from those, those key imperatives of, of authority and credibility of the system, which I think is much more diminished today than it was, say, two decades ago. It's a complex problem, and on a range of fronts, we need to tackle it. But what I'm offering you today is an approach which does combine some tough measures targeted at where they need to be, but also designed very deliberately to be about giving rehabilitation diversion, all of those important things, a proper chance. Do you want to buy an attorney? Uh, Did you want to say a few words? Yeah, look, um, I, I suppose it would be trite to just adopt the comments of my learned friends, but um, look, I think, uh, no, no, no doubt Lex um, uh, is um, you know, factually right in that part of the things that you're seeing, Adam, are a reflection of changes to the law in regards to bail, changes in the law in regards to sentencing. Um, but they are also, in part, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that we have a growing population, that we have complex issues in regards to mental health, that we have complex issues in regards to drug and alcohol addiction, uh, that we have complex issues in regards to prison rehabilitation. And um, whilst um, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with John's comments about um, the, uh, I suppose, the, 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 the criminal justice um, uh, elements of the response, all of those issues need to be dealt with if we're going to get uh, you know, a, a holistic response. We need to deal with mental health, sh health issues. We need to deal with drug and alcohol addiction. We need to deal with respect. We need to deal with disengaged youth. We need to deal with the types of rehabilitation programs we run in prisons. We need to deal with problems of public housing. They are all um, elements of uh, what is a very complex issue. And can I add? Yes. I we need. We need to deal and understand uh, the group of, the, of young people, particularly in the community, who take the view that they've just got nothing left to live for and that they don't care. They commit offences because they just don't care. They've got nothing to hope for. 
They've got no money in their pocket. They've got no job. Um, they've got already an alcohol and probably a pretty severe methamphetamine problem, and they just don't care. And they will commit an offence, probably a quite a serious offence. They'll be locked up. They'll be told by the judge, your conduct was violent and unforgivable. They'll go off. They'll serve their sentence. They'll be released on parole. They'll re-offend. They'll go back into custody. Then they'll be released again and commit another offence. Somewhere along the line, we need to tap all of the resources of the experts to tell us how we confront someone in that situation because that's a large number of people in the prison system and it's extraordinarily depressing. And I, I, I would urge people to take an interest in how the prison system works, on what life in custody really is like at Port Phillip or Barwon. And then ask yourself, how rehabilitated do you think you'd be after you'd spent five or six years out there? Very good question. And, and, Belinda. Just, and just picking up exactly that point, it is our children that are at greater risk of becoming career criminals. Um, they are the ones that are 80% likely to be back in prison within two years of serving their sentence. That's not a Victoria that we want to see. Uh, next question. Yes. Hello, Caitlin Offer, Australian Associated Press. Um, Justice Lazary, you, you approach this. Um, there are incredibly disadvantaged and disaffected youth. How, and I guess some of also the debate that we've had, particularly this year around those youths, could potentially, I would hazard, disaffect them even more. So how do we reach them? What, what approaches should we be taking as governments, for the government to reach those so that they are deferred from crime? Well, um, that's really a question to be asked of someone who's expert in social work and the so social mores that we're all dealing with rather than a judge. Um, I was in the dentist the other day and he, he said to me, don't you like coming here? And I said, no, not much. I said, and I never had a client who wanted to come to see me either. <laughs> um, and as a judge, I'm probably not qualified to answer your question because I'm at the end of the process, or I have been, and I will be again at the end of the process. By the time I get to see someone, um, it's, it's all happened. Uh, someone's life has been destroyed, um, often self-destroyed. Um, so I think, I think there are psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, other social com uh, commentators who have expertise in this area that we should be listening to about how, because it's a big project, about how to actually divert disaffected youth, that is the sort of young person that I was describing earlier, away from the commission of the offence. And the first step in that process, I'd say to you, is to do whatever is possible to divert them from the consumption of methamphetamine. I have been, not many things shocked me over the last 10 years, but I have been absolutely stunned at the prevalence of ice in our community. Uh, it's, it, it's been, I think, in just about every case I've tried, and its effect is appalling. It's personality changing, it's violence inducing, it's incredibly addictive. Um, and if you've got a kid of 17 or 18 who is embarking on that journey, their life is heading down the, the sewer very, very quickly and something has to be done about our, our, our drug problem. At, obviously at the higher level, at the level of the significant traffickers and so on. Uh, we already have very heavy penalties but the enforcement of that's important. But I think the, the social commentators, the social experts uh, are the people we need to be speaking to. Belinda? Yeah, look, I think um, another element is to look at the whole of crime approach too, um, and especially when it comes to youth. It's looking at other services such as child protection, and we've seen not enough money go to child protection services. Um, I know particularly in Gippsland, it's been where I'm from. It's been a problem for a number of years. Not being able to get qualified workers in those regions to assist these youths. Now, the children that Lex was talking about, a lot of them don't come from loving families. They come from households where there are um, huge problems, domestic violence, drug. And if we're not spending money on other services, including all those that um, His Honour mentioned, how are we going to protect our children? Do you want to quickly buy and then I'll go to the question over here? Oh, yep. Uh, where are we? Yes. Lisa Martin from The Guardian Australia. 
Uh, there's been a lot of focus this year on the overrepresentation of uh, Sudanese-born Victorians in uh, crime statistics. Uh, a few years ago, Amnesty International put out a report uh, about high um, post-traumatic stress disorder rates among Sudanese refugees. Uh, the report talked about people being forced to eat human flesh and disembowel bodies uh, during the Civil War. Is it possible to tackle that overrepresentation without paying specific attention to possible mental health issues? And how will uh, the major parties address that link between offending and mental illnesses? Martin Bakula. Well, um, thanks for, look, thanks for the question. Um, I, I don't underestimate uh, that there might be uh, individuals who are personally traumatised. I don't know. I don't know, frankly, uh, what level of, uh, well, what number of offenders are those who've been through those particular experiences that you've described. The government has announced uh, a royal commission into mental health, and I don't, for a moment, suggest that that is a be-all and end-all. But it is a. I think it is a very important approach in the same way that I think the Family Violence Royal Commission was a very important approach in regards uh, to providing us with answers about um, you know, the, the scourge of domestic violence. Um, in regards to the, um, the, the, the South Sudanese uh, offenders that you've referred to, look, uh, I think Victoria Police's African Gangs Task Force is a very important part of the solution because it is about involving that community in, in, in finding the solutions for the young people within that community. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you uh, do away with or, 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 or ignore what might be the punitive elements of the response, and there needs to be one in regards to some of the more uh, significantly violent offending, but it is also important that that community engages very deeply amongst itself uh, and for the older persons in that community to help the young people. And indeed, there are now a number of younger role models as well within that community um, who are, frankly, appalled by the damage being done to their own reputation by some of the more um, you know, unruly elements within their community. And some of those young people have been quite outspoken about that. And I know that they're involved in some projects as we speak. In regards to youth offending more generally, um, we, we had our Youth Justice Bill go through. It was largely bipartisan. John and I had a disagreement about youth control orders, um, which I'm happy to talk about in more detail if people want. Uh, but we also, and you know, this might be counterintuitive to some, um, we didn't want significantly violent 18 to 21 year olds being in the youth justice uh, facilities with impressionable younger people, 12-year-olds uh, to 15-year-olds, and so we have restricted the use of dual track uh, for those who are older and commissioning much more violent offences. Um, but apart from that, whether it's the youth control orders or the funded statewide youth diversion scheme, which I think the previous government commenced as a pilot and which um, has now been rolled out more generally, they are all part of the solution, but there is no doubting whether it's about Commonwealth resettlement services, mental health issues, um, or you know, community disconnect. Um, these are incredibly complex problems, uh, and it cannot be a one-size-fits-all response. John Pazuto. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in that that I would simply echo. Martin's right. We had a few disagreements on, on aspects, but what I would say, Lisa, is that uh, we have to be able, certainly in our roles, Martin as attorney, me potentially as attorney to be able to advance a number of policy imperatives concurrently, which may on the face of it seem dissonant, but are in fact quite consistent. I have every desire to want to make sure that every young child of whatever ethnic background, particularly where they've hailed from countries that have been exposed to you know, the most abominable conditions and persecution and inhumanity. I, I get all of that. I don't need any persuading on that. That much is obvious. We've got to you know, connect those people with support services, and we've certainly made some announcements in that space. But equally, we can't accept as that and adopt it as a premise for justice that you know, very violent behaviour, particularly where it's been conducted in a kind of loosely networked or gang-type formation, 
can be excused in any way. And I had a, a case in my own electorate in Hawthorne where there was a particular event, you probably know which one I'm talking about. I went and spoke to my constituents on that street and I spoke to a couple who on that Saturday night were waiting for police to arrive and were cowering, I kid you not, were cowering in their bathroom while people were banging on the door. Now, you know, I, I'm, I think we're all very compassionate people, uh, but when I heard that story, my heart sank. And these were people who never bothered anybody else. I spoke to the elderly gentleman who went to the aid of one of his neighbours who was being attacked and she was calling out for help. He got beaten up and all he was trying to do was save her. And so I, I guess I come around to where I began, that of course there are urgent needs to connect people with support services, but there are people experiencing the brunt of this kind of behaviour and they, they need to have a voice for them too. Can I just, can I just yes. add something? I'm sorry. We'll go to the next question. Yep. <clears throat> if you want a particular example of the connection between serious crime and post-traumatic stress disorder, go on to Ostley, find the judgment of the Court of Appeal in McQueen against Akon Gwode, who was the lady who drove her car into the lake at Werribee, killing three of her children and attempting to kill two others. I had the misfortune to sentence her. The Court of Appeal upheld her appeal and reduced the sentence I imposed. But the judgment of the Court of Appeal, even to some lesser, more plebeian extent, my judgment, uh, contains uh, some analysis of exactly the question you're asking. The link between mental health, between the sorts of stresses that she had gone through in the Sudan uh, and the offending that she was involved in, which was as serious as it gets. It's uh, a very interesting and informative example of that link. Thanks for the tip. Uh, Samantha, yes. Hi, Sam Hutchinson from The Australian. Um, this is a question for Justice Lazarus, but I'm also keen to hear what the rest of the panel has to say. So earlier this year, we had Peter Dutton, who made the comment to saying that many people in Melbourne were too afraid to go out for dinner, such was um, the crime rate and, and, and youth crime in Melbourne. Meanwhile, you sent the tweet out from Mansfield saying, in country Victorian Mansfield, we've been out for dinner and nobody's scared. What do you say to people who say comments like that perhaps show that the judiciary might be dismissive of everyday crime? Trolling, Sorry, might be trolling Peter Dutton, Lex Lazary. <laughs> oh, dismissive. <clears throat> uh, well, look, I think in the circumstances, um, on that particular topic, I wouldn't say anything. But thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> you, are you absolutely sure about that? I'm, uh, Michael, rarely this year have I been so sure of anything. <laughs> rest of the panel. Does anybody else? Well, are, are you scared to go out at night to restaurants? John no, no, Michael. And, and look, I, I did comment at the time on the tweet and, and I should put on record, I respect uh, Justice Lazarus as a, a distinguished jurist and a highly regarded member, not just of the legal community, but uh, of the community more generally. Can I make a general point, though, because this often comes up. Uh, for me, if you want an insight into my philosophical approach on all of this, judicial independence is an enduring principle and touchstone of justice in our society that must be defended at all costs. But with that, I think, comes a need for circumspection as well. And I, and I, I don't mean any disrespect, Les. I, I do have a disagreement. I hope you'll forgive me for expressing it. But I do think it's really important. And this... this is an issue which is not just unique to Victoria, but there is a tension that all societies like ours must manage where there is a concern about what some would regard at times as a judicial mandate uh, that challenges certain perceptions about whether courts are there to apply the law, whether they're to make the law. Now, we can have a whole debate. There's a, there's a huge discussion in that. But I, I do think it, it, it is a, you know, an example of why uh, moving into that space does create some risks and that's why I commented the way I did at the time. I'll just say in response to that, um, I take the point. Uh, the criticism of me was a valid criticism and that's why I don't want to say any more about it. Um, it wasn't my best move. Um, but um, judges obviously are human beings. Mm. Judges are human beings of all sorts, holding all sorts of views. And I suspect in the future we, or my colleagues and I, are going to have to tread uh, a difficult line uh, because I do hold to the view that judges should be more public uh, and should be more informing of the public about the work we do. Now, I don't count my tweet as falling into that category, but 
people will have a better respect for the judiciary and understand the way the judiciary works better if the judiciary itself is out there explaining the work we do. And uh, that may offend some people's idea of, of independence. It may offend some people's idea of whether judges should only ever be heard in court. I hold to the view, obviously, that judges should not only be heard in court, but are entitled to be heard elsewhere. That aside, you've got a very entertaining Twitter account, Lex Lansbury. I highly I, recommend it. I have. I have. <laughs> Lots of I, fast cars. I haven't mentioned any minister in the federal government since. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're fast. Did you want to say something? No, we're fast running out of time. And I know a student at uh, Kilvington. We'll get to you shortly. But Matt, firstly. Hi, uh, Matt Johnston from the Herald Sun. Um, the Sentencing Guidelines Council uh, it was an idea to get victims, judges, DPP, everyone together and give advice on sentencing. Judges said it wasn't a good idea, it was a blurring of lines and it sort of fell apart. I'm not sure whether it's potentially resurrected or not, but I was particularly interested in Justice Lazary's view, but also the two MPs as to what your plan going forward to look at that again or try to refresh it if possible. And if we could all keep our responses fairly short because we are fast running out of time. Uh, this was right at the end of my time. I might be re familiarised with it shortly, but the problem simply uh, from the court's point of view was whether serving judges should serve on the council or not, and then a secondary problem became whether reserve judges such as I am now should serve on the council, and I had the impression, perhaps rightly or wrongly, that the government accepted that retired judges with whom the court had no problem serving would fill those positions. Uh, look. Um the Sentencing Guidelines Council idea um, was one that uh, I'd heard about through the Sentencing Advisory Council and that I uh, then learned more about when I visited uh, England and Scotland a couple of years ago. In fact, I noted that I think uh, the Scottish uh, Sentencing Council handed down its first guideline decision just yesterday. Um, it's been well publicised that uh, myself and the courts uh, had and have a disagreement or had a disagreement about the role of serving judges. Um, I, I was disappointed uh, that the courts adopted the approach that they did. Uh, there are serving judges on both the English and Scottish Sentencing Guidelines Council and uh, I personally think that that, is, that, that has proven to be uh, a, very, uh, a very worthwhile uh, innovation in both of those jurisdictions. They're slightly different in Scotland uh, the, effectively, the Court of Appeal has to validate the decisions of the Guidelines Council. Now, the Supreme Court uh, here in Victoria has indicated that they do not see a role for serving judges. Uh, I expressed my views about that at the time. Uh, but dialogue continues between the government and the courts about a workable model. Uh, and whilst, whilst that dialogue continues, I think uh, we will keep uh, the details of those discussions between ourselves. Thanks, Matt. I haven't been a huge fan of the council for this reason. I'm not hostile to the idea, but for me, as I've indicated throughout my remarks today, that disconnect can be assisted by communication, as Justice Lazary has been saying, from the courts through the community. But I also think the bigger problem and the, the bigger challenge for us is actually traffic the other way and for courts increasingly to feel broad sentiment across the community. It's not going to be one uniform view, of course. So my concern is whether the council would aid that traffic in public sentiment back to the courts, uh, or whether it be more the other way about justifying why the system is working the way it does and why we should all accept it thus. Um, the other thing that I would just say is more as an, an observation, not a reason not to do it, is I, I'm very protective as a member of the parliament of parliament's prerogatives in this space to determine that. Now, a, a Sentencing guidance count, Guidelines Council doesn't uh, foreclose Parliament's ability to set sentencing policy, but it will have a tendency to subdue that. And I think that's Parliament's responsibility as much as a prerogative. It's not our policy, we don't, and we don't have any plans to. As I said, I'm not hostile to the idea. It just it, it comes with a few challenges, I think, for us. OK, well, uh, we might finish up unless there are any last questions with one of the students at Kilvington College. Yes. Uh, uh, and after you. Um, so I'm Sarah from Kilvington Grammar and my question was just directed at um, Mr Pursuto about how early you were saying how um, people in outer suburbs may feel less safe than those 
in the inner suburbs of Melbourne. So my question was just, what would you suggest to those people in the outer suburbs, what they could do or not do to feel safer? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's the responsibility of the government of the day. Uh, it shouldn't be something, in my view, that we should, as political leaders, throw back to communities to say, this is what you need to do. I think, and Martin, tell me if I'm wrong, I think you probably have a similar view, that uh, I don't think any government would want to leave communities feeling like they're out there on their own. Uh, so I, I see it more as what, what do I need to do if I become the attorney, if I'm given that privilege, what do I need to do to make sure they don't feel vulnerable the way they do. Now, I just should hasten to add, it's not a uniform sentiment or feeling across the community, but I'm convinced from the travels I've undertaken over the last four years that there are communities that feel that way. And, you know, I was out at Sydenham the other day uh, talking to some people who regularly see trouble in their neighbourhoods around Taylor's Hill. That doesn't mean everything in Taylor's Hill is problematic, but speaking to those communities, you do get a sense that they really feel it. We've got time for one very final question. If you can keep it brief, sir, uh, then we'll uh, wrap it up. If we can get a microphone in your direction. Mr. Pasuto, um, last year I finally got so impatient with Tim Smith and his regular gig with John Fain when he finished off one day by saying, <coughs> what was the quote, lax sentencing is the responsibility of the government, that I thought I'd do a bit of research because it was plain that no one within your party was doing the research. What I found was this. In 2011, the average minimum sentence for murder was 19.4 years. In 2016, it was 22.3. The Minimum sentence must be served before a prisoner can be sent, considered parole. In the UK, the average time served is 17 years. In New South Wales, 20 years. <coughs> I'll go to aggravated burglary, which is so something that you think, obviously think is very serious. If you keep it uh, yeah, sure. very brief, because we Aver need to... The average penalty for aggravated burglary has increased from 2.6 to 3.3 years in the last four years. I could go on. Rape, mm. incest, so on. All of these classifications, Victoria's sentences are heavier than in other jurisdictions. How can your leaders, Tim Smith and others, continue to trot out the line that there is lax sentencing in Victoria? I actually think sentencing in Victoria is a disgrace. I think we've gone way overboard and, and we've, got to, we've got to halt the situation somehow. But I'd love to have, you, have your comment as to how you can justify, quotes, lax sentencing. Tim's not leader yet, is he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank, you, thank you for your question. Uh, look, we might just have to disagree on, on agree to disagree on on that. Not not every category would be as you described. There are a number of categories where even today, they they in our view wouldn't reflect community sentiment. That's what baseline was and what standard sentencing is is broadly intended to do. Can I just make a general comment though in answer to this? And it picks up a point Belinda made. One thing I think we can all be proud of as Victorians is that in this state, despite very you know, contested areas on policy. In Victoria, you have to do something pretty bad to land in jail, and that's a good thing. It's a mark of an enlightened society. When I went to Texas and Washington and New York two years ago to look at their justice system, I think it's important to just note, perhaps even with a little bit of pride, that we don't do things as badly as maybe other countries do. In the United States, it's, uh, as a result, I would say, of things like the election of judges, the election of district attorneys, they throw everyone in jail. And the reforms that they've undertaken, well, let me come to that, they are trying to, but the problem they've created for themselves over generations is that they've been jailing people for jumping turnstiles, and the jails are full. So I met with Senator Cornyn's staff and uh, Dick Durbin's staff, two leading Republicans on these types of things. They've taken their version of mandatory sentencing way over the top. In Victoria, we have a system that is reasonably well calibrated in terms of its foundations. Where we have differences, they're fairly targeted and they don't suggest that we are looking to overturn the fundamental structure of our justice system. As for the sentences, I think there are categories of sentencing uh, where Victoria doesn't compare well to other states. I'm not going to burden everybody with that. I'm happy to talk to you offline. But, but 
but there are categories where that mm. is the case. And Martin Bakula, very, very briefly. Yeah, I just wanted to very quickly add on this point. Um, the other thing, and I, I, I meant to mention it earlier, is that the, the, the other thing that is moving the dial in sentencing undoubtedly is the Court of Appeal. Um, there has been, you know, whether you look at Dalgleish or some other decisions where, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the regime uh, has been moving. Uh, and there was an, an excellent piece, I'm not, I'm not here to do many photos, there was an excellent piece by Justin Quill, I think last week in the Herald Sun, which made this very point. Uh, and if people want to understand the way that the Court of Appeal is, is moving the dial in regards to the tariff, um, I'd encourage people to read that. Just a couple of very quick fire questions for me before we end the, the topical. Firstly, today's news poll, uh, John Pizzuto, shows that since April there's been a drop of 7% amongst Victorian voters confident in the Liberal Party's ability to handle crime. Is it a case that your tough on crime rhetoric is not appealing increasingly to Victorian voters? Look, you'll judge all for yourselves. You're fairly discerning people. Uh, if you can get a read on what sort of person I come across as, you might might discern that I'm not really interested in trying to look tough or soft or anything. I've tried to outline for you all today my philosophical approaches, my personal approaches to how I would deal with very complex issues. They involve some tough decisions. At times they involve uh, erring on the side of compassion. Uh, but you'll, you'll just have to judge for yourself. I'm not particularly focused on, on those and you can't do much about polls. And finally, Martin Pakula, as the Chief Law Officer of Victoria, isn't it at the very least a monumentally bad look that you're not cooperating with the fraud squad's inquiry into the red shirts? Well, well, thank, thank you, thank you for the question, Michael. Let me, let me respond. Let me, let me respond. I think Matt Johnson will be disappointed that it was you that got to ask that. Um, let, let, let me say two things about that. First of all, the Chief Commissioner uh, has been very clear about not commenting on an ongoing investigation, and uh, and I think I'll take my lead from him. Secondly, let me say uh, say this. Uh, I think it is. Uh, Unless people have specific knowledge about exactly what is being investigated and exactly who has been asked to do what, uh, it is perilous to make assumptions about that. You could assist police with their inquiries, though. Uh, well, I'm, well uh, as I said, Michael, if you listen to what I've said, unless you know exactly uh, what is being investigated uh, and who has been asked to provide assistance, people shouldn't make assumptions unless they have a proper foundation for doing so. And that's where we'll leave it. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel, the Shadow Attorney General, John Pizzuto, <laughs> the Attorney General, Mark Bakula, who's probably never going to speak to me again, uh, Justice Lex Lazary, whose Twitter account, by the way, is at Lazary08. <laughs> and by the way, you're not following me, Lex, so you've got to rectify that. Uh, and uh, Belinda Wilson, the President of the Law Institute of Victoria. Thank you so much. And to both uh, John Pizzuto and Martin Pakula, to both of you, all the best of luck on November the 24th. Thank you all very much for joining us for lunch today and have a fantastic Wednesday. I'll see you at the next event.